They're enough to make you sick, or at least green with envy. Jeff Bezos and Pierre Omidyar had simple why-didn't-I-think-of-it ideas to cash in on the internet boom. And now both of them are billionaires. One started Amazon.com, the other eBay. Companies that don't make big profits yet, but whose share prices have soared on expectations that one day they will. In the meantime, they're laughing all the way to the bank. And in the case of Jeff Bezos, the rest of the time too. <laughs> the thing that strikes you first and most profoundly about Jeff Bezos is his laugh. <laughs> and to say this remarkably unremarkable billionaire has a lot to laugh about would be one of the great understatements of the 21st century. We're fairly crass, you see, but we'd like to talk about money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in your wildest dreams, did you ever anticipate making the $48 billion mark? Uh, no, um, this is extremely unusual, and I did not ever anticipate my wildest dreams. So what, did you just expect the, the, the odd lazy million? Not <laughs> I've been described as a nerd aspiring to be a geek, and I think that's probably about right, so. <laughs> for those who've been logged off for the last four years, Jeff Bezos' story of how to become the Internet's first and biggest tycoon is worth retelling and learning from. Hello, you guys. I found this startling fact um, while I was working on Wall Street, which was that web usage was growing at 2,300% a year. Things don't grow that fast. It's very unusual. And picked books primarily because there are more than three million different books active and in print worldwide uh, in, in all languages. So when you have that huge number of products like you do in the, in the book category, you can build a store online that can only exist online. About the same time as Jeff Bezos was setting up Amazon, Pierre Omidier was backing a hunch too. His wife was a collector of these things, Pez lolly dispensers. They were the craze back in the 50s, apparently. The internet site he set up so she could swap these for different ones turned into eBay and into billions. I kind of started up, uh, started up the site back in 1995 and uh, kind of worked on it nights and weekends and, and uh, developed it until the point where the checks were coming in uh, they were piling in, <laughs> piling up at the door, and at the end of one month, I realized I was making more money from my hobby than I was at my day job, so it was time to quit the day job and turn to the hobby full-time. The idea was simple. Via the internet, put people who wanted to sell with people who wanted to buy. Set up an auction and charge a fee for being the middleman. This online flea market is now one of the world's most popular websites. Um, on any given day, uh, users are adding 300 to 400,000 new items every single day. And uh, if you go to the site today, you'll see uh, over 3 million items for sale. Um, you know, we're on track to doing over $2 billion uh, this year. So uh, the, uh, this person-to-person -person trading that's happening between individuals is really a very significant global phenomenon. The claim is that customers get hooked. Uh, there's an addiction going on here. I think if you think about it, you know, Collectors are, are very passionate people, and uh, when you give them a place where they can all of a sudden find all those collectibles that they've been searching for in one place, I mean, they, they really do get hooked. From buying the missing cup for grandma's tea service, to trading car parts, to auctioning off all manner of weird collectibles, eBay's customers bid for, pay up, and receive their purchases with admirable but surprising honesty. Are you constantly amazed at how successful this has been? Absolutely. I mean, the uh, you know when I started out uh, four years ago, um, I had no idea it was going to be uh, this kind of phenomenon. But it's just such a simple idea. I guess it's amazing someone didn't think of it before you. Well, I guess somebody has to be the first to think about <laughs> it. So I don't I don't know what to say. <laughs> but Jeff Bezos, as ever, has plenty to say about it in his distinctive, goofy, geeky way. One of the ways I made the decision to start Amazon.com uh, was to try and think about it in terms of a regret minimization framework. And the idea is, when you're 80, you want to look back and have minimized the regrets. And I think a lot of people behave this way. Just very few of them uh, speak of it in such a nerdy way. 
If only all our regrets were so minimised as his. If only we could all have been among his original investors. For them, Amazon.com has become Amazon.cash. They've all become billionaires. Were those 15 investors that you first took on board sleeping well at night when you first started? Well, I, th they were sleeping pretty well because I told them that they were going to lose their money for sure. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> I did. Because that, that was them, your mum, your dad, yeah, and other Yeah, most people. of them were friends or friends of friends. And so when you're raising money from friends and friends of friends, you, you want to still be able to spend holiday weekends with them <laughs> no matter what happens. So it's best to... Um, you know, uh, really set expectations low. And, and also that was the truth. Anybody who, you know, when we started almost four years ago, who would have predicted this kind of success would have needed to have been institutionalized, <laughs> tied up in multiple straitjackets and, you know, because it's not predictable. It's a very unusual business situation. Seattle's highest profile company is not at the top end of town. With no name outside, the world headquarters for the world's biggest bookstore is instead squeezed into a sleazy district downtown between loan sharks, strip joints, and a soup kitchen. Like everyone else in his office, Bezos uses an old door as a desk. He likes to keep reminders of tougher times. Another reminder is the old Honda he shares with his wife but is thinking of trading in. Actually, I'm sort of considering getting a Volvo. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to figure out what do we really want in a car, and it seemed like the most logical thing to want is like extra airbags, <laughs> you know. <So. laughs> Everyone who works for him is given shares in the company, which means he waits on an increasing number of unlikely millionaires at every staff Christmas party. One of the things that, that I think about, and I try to get everybody here at Amazon.com to think about, because there are a whole bunch of shareholders here at Amazon.com, everybody in the company has stock options, a lot of people have done very well, is that that wealth is paper wealth, and it goes away the second we stop doing a good job for our customers. So I encourage everybody to wake up every morning terrified in a sweat and uh, but to be precise about what they're afraid of when they wake up and they shouldn't be afraid of competition they shouldn't be afraid of a whole bunch of external things they should be afraid of our customers because those are the people that we have a relationship with and we need to figure out how to take care of them so there's that 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 notion of it it really truly is paper wealth and it really truly can go away as fast as it came it's like the world's most eclectic bookstore because everything is there's just books everywhere and they're all different kinds and they're not sorted in any way. We'll show you how. It's taken Amazon only five years to woo six million customers to its way of shopping. And then we'll sign you in. And here you are. It says, Welcome back, Elizabeth Hayes. From the books I've ordered in the past, Jeff's computer has decided it knows my tastes. Well, it was closed because I do have a few of those. And oh, I've good. read them already. So that, oh, was, good. that was very clever. And, and recommends not only one. other books I might like to buy, but videos and CDs as well. Frank Sinatra, Frank Sinatra. Joni Mitchell, Emmy Lou Harris, The Chieftains, and songs from Ally McBeal featuring Vonda Shepard. What sort of girl do? does that make me? <laughs> For all the high tech though, Jeff still has the old fashioned sense to listen to customers, or at least read their email. Email turns off the politeness gene in the human being. It's sort of wonderful, you know, because people will tell you what they really think. <laughs> and and that, how. And how, and that's what you want. The politeness gene is turned off, he said. <laughs> I think, I think that is, that's one of the powers of the medium, um, and that's actually one of the things that is been responsible for our success, I have to tell you, because customers will tell you exactly what they think, and they, if you're doing something wrong, they tell you right away. And uh, only a company that can behave and, and react very rapidly to that kind of feedback will succeed in this medium. Pierre Omidia is a lot less flamboyant than Jeff Bezos, but has just as much to laugh about. What he spends for what he brings in doesn't begin to justify the value investors put on his company. 
Like Jeff Bezos, he happens to have happened upon what investors regard as the happening thing. eBay is really a business that has uh, that is a new business that could not have existed before the internet. So it's truly a business of the future. And I think that's what investors are looking at. This truly is day one. This is a world where there are going to be thousands and thousands of successful companies created. It's not going to be a winner-take-all type of environment. The fact is, Jeff Bezos would have to sell every book sold in the world to justify his company's share price. With giddy future possibilities, but sobering present profit margins, Amazon has been pushed so high in the current mania for internet shares that even Jeff Bezos advises people not to put money into his company. I remember looking at this order, I thought, I think I know what's going on here. I think if you're a small investor, one of your primary investment objectives should be able to get a good night's sleep every night. <laughs> Does it disappoint you that we tend to want to know more about the money than anything else? It doesn't disappoint me. I think it's a very natural kind of curiosity. Um, but I do think that if people knew um, what it really felt like, then they'd be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs>